Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into the Aftermath Podcast. It's one day late. We had some glitches on Sunday, as did the Patriots. Phil Perry will join us in just a second. The Patriots have to do some uh, introspection over the next six weeks and five games. Made a lot of progress, or some pro- mild progress, over the last four games, but it was undone quite a bit on Sunday in Miami. Here's Gerard Mayo talking about where they are now and what they're trying to accomplish in the last six weeks in terms of instilling a culture that prevents that kind of performance from ever happening again. I never thought that we would uh, be able to reestablish a culture, you know, in year one, it's a process. It's hard to change a culture and uh, we're trying to put those pieces together. I think it would be a disservice, you know, to get to the end of the year and not know exactly what we have from a player or coaching perspective. And uh, that has to be our, our focus. All right. Before I bring in the Senator, just want to reiterate that what we saw in Miami was the kind of soup to nuts incompetence that really undoes the weeks of progress. You want to be tough. You want to be smart. You want to be disciplined. One out of three ain't bad. And I'm not even sure they're that tough right now. You want to be a team that nobody wants to play. Well, what got slapped out there on Sunday isn't going to make anybody hesitate to get on a plane and play the Patriots. Four games, Jets, Titans, Bears, and Rams, since they looked like a mess. The last time they had was Jacksonville in London. They got demolished. Now they're back at it again. They're back at it with the offensive penalties, unforced. They had 10 for 75 total as a team. Oodles of pre-snap, four on poor Vidarian over there. Jailbreak protection with four sacks, including a, a strip sack of Drake May and a pressure leading to his one pick. Defensively, the coverage was, again, kind of clueless. Jonathan Jones talking about miscommunication and a lack of focus after the game. Tua Tungavailoa was 22 for 26 for 279 yards, throwing to Jonu Smith, Jalen Waddell, and Tyreek Hill. Four incompletions to those guys. You knew they were good. Didn't do anything about it. Devon A. Chain had uh, two virtual walk-in touchdowns off the screen. So now the team is 3-9. and nine. By Thanksgiving, you figure they wanted a toehold. They ain't got one. They got Indy next week, then they have the bye, and then their final four games are no picnic. Two against Buffalo, you got Arizona in there, and the Chargers. Let's bring in the Senator now, who has returned from Miami. He's getting ready for the breakdown on Monday. Phil, welcome in. Thanks for having me, Thomas. Oh, my God, it's my pleasure. It's been too long, far too long people have heard you. Um, appreciate you breaking out some time here because I know Monday's busy. Can you give me some perspective on what we saw yesterday and what the mood was around the team? Because we've heard it was a little lighter than expected in the locker room. Yeah, let's start there because something okay. must have happened in the locker room when I wasn't in there. Must have. Must have. <laughs> Between Carnival Andrew game. Callahan and Greg Bedard and Mark Daniels and Chad Graff, I don't know if it was during Drake May's press conference because I'll just tell you what I did post game go to the interview room hear from Gerard Mayo hear from Christian Gonzalez uh start to go into the Patriots locker room when Gonzalez is done because it's not always the case where Drake May is right up to the podium in quick succession but I could see Drake May waiting right by the interview door as soon as I walked into the little hallway that takes you in the locker room and Drake May by the way Tom looks like he is being physically held up by a couple of different Patriots equipment staff container bins he is leaning up against it like they're holding him up with one arm on top of it, with his head on top of his arm. Like he just went 12 rounds with uh, Mike Tyson, not a week ago, but like 20 years ago, 1988. Yeah. And so as soon as I saw him waiting there, I just, I just did a little button hook myself and went back into the interview room. So I, I didn't really get into the locker room, but something had to have happened because when I was in there, I did get in there. Eventually I didn't sense what people are describing. Do you hear a couple of conversations here and there where guys are uh, messing around with each other? I guess, you know, but mm-hmm. nothing that stood out to me. So I really think something – because the, guy, the guys that are writing this today have been in a lot of post-game locker rooms before. And so I don't think they're just making it up out of whole cloth. I just don't think I was in there for it, unfortunately. So there was no telltale silly string on the floor, no water <laughs> balloons busted or anything like that? No, and you know this too, Tom. Sometimes – the mood in a locker room isn't what you think it should be. And I try not to make up a lot of that because I, I don't think it it means a whole lot. You know, there have been a lot of 
downcast locker rooms over the course of the last few years that maybe told you that players cared, but it led to absolutely nothing in the way of play mm-hmm. on the field. Right. And we've seen after bad losses, we've seen guys mess around with each other and uh, you know have a good time by the table where they're getting their food before they go onto the bus, and then they go off and they win five games in a row and they go to the Super Bowl. So I'm just telling you what I saw, and it wasn't really anything yeah. out of the norm. It is always hard to gauge the requisite requisite level of uh, sadness after a game. You're supposed to act like it's a morgue. I'm sure that a lot of high school coaches feel that way. Um, but it was not a performance that was indicative of a high level of focus either. So that's the bigger issue. You Correct. can't couple the two things. If you lose 21-20, oh, damn, it was tough down here in Miami. We played a crisp game and just lost. When you slap it out there like like that, there's a level of consternation that would accompany anything resembling giddiness. Heading towards week 13, Phil, I, I kind of figured that this was out of their system based on the four weeks prior. They had cleaned up penalties. They were still getting regularly lit up defensively by any team that had a veteran coach or quarterback as a combo. It's it's scary when you look back that the games, the only game that they've been competitive in, in which there was a veteran coach and quarterback combo was uh, Cincinnati. Rodgers killed him in the first game. Houston murdered him. Uh, on and on. You can check it yourself. But I thought this was out of their system, Phil. I thought it might be too, Tom, and that's what I think has to be so discouraging about this game because we've seen the Patriots go down to Miami before and lose games they shouldn't lose and play poorly when we weren't expecting it. But it was it was the way in which they lost to me that signals a step back, not in terms of their on-the-field competency necessarily, though that was definitely part of it. To me, the, the more important and um, – more alarming step back that they took was from an identity standpoint and from a cultural yeah. standpoint. The, what they want to be is smart and tough and dependable and versatile and complementary offense, defense, special teams, all working together. And they weren't close to that. And the fact that they're still looking for that at some level is really discouraging for them, I think, because – that identity that they're talking about has nothing to do with talent. They don't even talk about wins, Tom. They know they're not going to the postseason. Being smart, tough, and dependable, you can be those things and still lose games just because you have less talent than the other guys. But what they're doing is hurting themselves by doing all of these things that should be within their control, or not doing them, I should say. The penalties, the lapses defensively, the coaching Mm -hmm. miscues, the game plan mistakes. It's that that to me is the biggest issue because, you know, for four games, you were at least in it with four other NFL teams and Sunday was a laugher. Yeah, I wrote a column today. I'm just going to kind of summarize and riff a little bit of it, Phil. It, you know, we understand Bill Belichick left the team smoking in a ditch, but they have made so little progress in getting the car out of said ditch because, you know, really aside from May and some increased offensive production based on his presence, There's literally nothing that this team can hang its hat on that inspires optimism. There's not one position group that is appreciably better. They've gotten lit up, as I was saying, in the passing game by Geno Smith, Matt Stafford, Tua, Aaron Rodgers, C.J. Stroud. They've had the ball run through their face by the Niners, the Dolphins, the Texans, the Jaguars, the Titans. 13 sacks defensively in the last six games, and nine of them came against the Bears. Two of the three times they've matched up with new staffs, Phil, that's a ridiculous. Seattle stat. and Tennessee, they lost them both. What were you going to say, bud? I'm sorry. That was a ridiculous stat. They've had 13 sacks in six games, and nine of them came in one yeah. game? Yep. Sorry. Yep. Continue, yep. please. Yep. So, you know, you take out the 50-year-old expertise of Bill. Steve Belichick is a defensive play car. Mayo's undivided attention on stopping offenses, and you replace him with a first-year defensive coordinator in, in Covington. You take out Bentley, Peppers, far more for a large part of the season and Judon surprise. They're not very good, but they're so far removed from good at every position group. Meanwhile, on offense, they're so poorly staffed. You can't even get mad at it. I mean, you can, but it's not going to make it any better. And everybody there is a temp except for unwinner. So they can't be benched either because they're as bad as they got. You're going to like this too. It, it, it's, it's a little callous, but 
11 wideouts taken in the first two rounds. Only one has fewer catches than Jalen Polk's 12. That's Ricky Pearsall. He's got 11. He got shot on August 31st. Okay. That's not what you're looking for for production. They need edge rushers, cornerbacks, offensive tackles, wide receivers. And aside from quarterback, those are the most highly coveted positions. No evidence that the personnel fellas, Elliot Wolf and Matt Grow, who had some say when they were there with Bill, are equipped to, equipped to go ahead and staff those spots. So the last point I'm going to make before I, I, I give the ball back to you here is they're badly staffed, poorly coached, and they lack focus. And ownership tried to thread the, bo- the post-Belichick needle. They didn't expect what happened last year. They didn't want Bill to run another rebuild. But they tried to thread the needle because removing Bill was enough seismic change. So they figured the promising people like Wolf and Mayo would flourish in Bill's absence. But it's new coaches taking over a bad roster. A disappointing record was to be expected. But the kind of boobery that we saw on display Sunday, Phil, it's going to give you pause. And they got five weeks. Excuse me, five games in six weeks to make it better. They've had their head in the sand since 2017. Whether it's the Brady exodus, whether it's personnel and drafting, whether it's free agency, whether it's we'll be fine with Matt Patricia and Joe Judge, whether it's we can try and thread the needle here post bill, the urgency hasn't been present. Now you got a first round quarterback who's on a rookie contract who's probably the best of the lot. Thank you for your patience. You got a flotation device, Phil. You're the only team among the nine who has that. The nine others who suck Raiders, Titans, all them, Panthers. They got the best one. They got to they act quick. They really have to be hanging judges over the next by the time january 5th gets here thank you for your patience no that was great and i i agree with you wholeheartedly and and we'll i guess we'll see if elliot wolf has the ability to show the kind of urgency you're looking for and the creativity to find the pieces that he needs because i'm not sure they're all just going to be there waiting at their door and saying hey as long as you give me enough money i'm happy to show up whether right. it's an offensive tackle or receiver or anything else that they need I think this loss really put on display all the organizational failures that they're going through at the moment at all levels. So you start with the players. Vidarian Lowe and Demontre Jacobs are not starting caliber NFL tackles. That, that is a talent issue that they just cannot get past. And your point is, is a great one that you, you get mad at it. It's really not going to do anything. They're so poorly staffed at that position, Tom. They had a guy commit a holding penalty and three false starts, and he was right on the scene for a strip sack fumble of Drake May, and the other tackle was actually so much worse that he was the one who got benched. <laughs> and and he got replaced by a guard <laughs> in City So. So that's how bad the tackle spot is right now for them, and so that to me points to the roster building, and the front office and the failures there because really all they did, to your point, is improve the quarterback position. I think you could argue maybe tight end. I think at one yeah. point in time you could argue kicker, although he missed yesterday too. Joey Poor Sly, Joe, the kicking Joe. guy. Joe and oh. Sly, the kicking guy, is going south. Man, so – and then coaching. And, and to me, even though I start with the talent and that being the reason why they lost yesterday, to me the coaching is right up there with it. Because not only were there penalties, which to me is related to coaching, Tom, but for players like Kyle Duggar and Marcus Jones and Jonathan Jones, experienced guys after the game in that locker room to be talking about a lack of focus and a lack of communication, that to me comes back to coaching. For Devon Godshaw to tell us that they made an adjustment at halftime after they'd just gotten walloped 24 nothing in the second quarter and they made an adjustment at halftime that helped them out and for him to be openly asking – and I'm not sure why we didn't do it a little sooner, but I'm glad we did. That comes back to coaching. And so I start with the players. I don't know where you start when it comes to this game in particular, but the coaching is is right there too. They didn't do themselves any favors yesterday. I start with the p- players based upon what the players say. you know. But then I, I watched Demarcus Covington's defense get riddled again, and it's been riddled in so many different ways um, by different quarterbacks. Anybody with – any level of competency is having a day. I mean, CJ Stroud and the Texans sprinted to a lead against them. And then the Patriots 
you know, he didn't overall have a ridiculous day, but Joe Mixon still ran for 102. You know, I, I Calvin Ridley had a day. Everybody's had a day. On the ground, Jacksonville had a day. They can't, they can't stop the run. They can't stop the pass. They can't pressure the passer. They can't stay on sides at critical points. They can't keep their hands off receivers. I think that DeMarcus Covington either needs a co-defensive coordinator or they need a new defensive coordinator next year. I mean, we spent an unbelievable amount of time on Alex Van Pelt and Drake May because Drake May is the entity that you look at and go, that has to be developed. But they're non-competitive at times defensively, just befuddled. And Peppers is a much bigger loss, I think, than people give it credit for. And he has gone off, you know, to exile his own little personal Elba because of what he did. You don't talk about it much. But that is a, a huge blow because he's been the team MVP the two years prior, I thought. But Kyle Duggar is a $17 million a year player, and he's been bad two weeks in a row. And he wasn't great before. They can't generate a friggin' turnover unless Dorian Thompson – smashes it off some guy's helmet they're they not gave, good they're, they gave they're bad they gave Duggar chances yesterday too I mean one of them would have been huge in the red zone um had a had an interception go right off his hands went on the play before I think he thought he would have had maybe a pick six but Martin yes. Mapu put his hands up and it he got hit in the back of the head um he's clearly hurt I talked to him after the game for a while his aunt you can see is that his his cleat is actually spatted he has the one cleat uh, spatted as opposed to the other and he's been dealing with his ankle injury for weeks and I think that's part of the reason why he's slow to react against one of the fastest teams in football yesterday it's such a glaring issue I mean he was on the scene for I think every single touchdown they had Tom and, and yeah, to the me the chain touchdown out on the right in the screen the real walk in was that's not an ankle no that, and that's a good point point. and I actually have started asking around just to make sure it it was his fault. It looks like his fault. It looks like he and Marcus Jones have some combination of the two backs that are in the backfield. They went with a little pony set, so they're in the shotgun. They had a back on either side of Tua. My assumption is what everybody's assumption is, which is one guy goes out one way, one guy goes out the other way. Whichever side the back comes, uh, that is that is the defender who has him. Uh, but I've started asking around to see if we can get a uh, clear definition on what the responsibilities were on that play. Cause it was so bad. You know, the Patriots are 16 and 35 since the wind game in Buffalo, 16 and 35. That was, December I only know that because I read your column earlier. Oh, so you had to hear me recite most of it again. Sorry. Well, yes, um, but it was great. The second time I always read your column oh. columns at least seven times. So now I've only got five more. Thanks guy. <laughs> um, so that's why I'm talking about urgency. This is, you can't just sit there and say, well, we got to give Gerard and Elliot and Matt grow and, and everybody else more time to grow because that's in a vacuum. That group is in a vacuum of leadership that they did just get there, but because they were asleep at the switch organizationally and in build, they trusted for a long time, this rebuild is extended. So I don't know if you get the luxury of having the time. It's been frittered, frittered away since the end of 2019. Eight no start, and then since then, God knows what the record is. It ain't good. Um, but it's so that's 2019, December of 2019, December of 2020, 21, 22, 23, 24. It's five years of of stink. It's you, you get what I'm driving at here. This is a half decade of not being a good football team. So the urgency really has not taken root. We saw that in the off season. It was such a difficult thing for, for Robert Kraft to fathom. How do I move on from Bill in a delicate way, but move on from him and, and move on to the next situation, even though I really want to build to get the record here, even though I really wanted to be able to have a, you know, a no fault divorce, we move on. Bill gets the record. And it doesn't have to be ugly. It, it ended up being that way. And you, really, in hindsight, they still hadn't won their third game at this time last year. I understand why they moved on. And everybody wants to look at this year and last year. Yeah, they're not better than they were last year, but they might not be worse. <laughs> might not be worse. <laughs> well, the, um, quarterback, the, the quarterback alone makes them better, I think. Yeah. But right. the defense is 
the defense and the coaching and the personnel and the performance is atrocious. It's not even half as good as last year. So offense, if you call it, hell, offense is 50% better, which it probably is. Defense is 50 to 75 times, 75% worse. When you talk about urgency, my math. you're talking about big yeah. picture urgency, uh, which I understand. What do you think about in-season urgency and what they've showed there? Because I think I think the acceptance of this roster and the state that it's in, I've worried all season that that acceptance, that the team from ownership on down, understanding that they're in a rebuilding year and understanding that they just aren't very talented, was eventually going to seep into the players and their approach to mm -hmm. games and saying, well – if this is sort of a throwaway year for the for the organization, you know, I guess I got to play to put good tape on film. I got to I got to play to keep my job. I got to play to maybe have another team want me eventually. But winning and losing, eh? What's the diff? As long as I'm playing well, mm -hmm. I wonder if we're there yet, because I I do I do sense, and this is not having anything to do with the locker room, which uh, and yesterday in particular, the locker room's behavior. But I just I do wonder if they've gotten there. Uh, and I wonder if things like, you know, Gerard Mayo looking at DeMarcus Covington and saying, well, I'm, I'm a defensive coach. I'm a defensive coordinator level person. At least I'm a head coach in this league. I'm, I'm, I'm my expertise is defense. Should I be going and taking the play sheet? Or does he say, ah, it's New England Patriots 2024. We're all just sort of feeling this thing out. What am I going to go and take that away from DeMarcus? You know, when we know we're not going anywhere anyway, should they be showing more yeah. urgency in season, I, I guess. in game? It's a great question, Phil, and I think what it leads to is a conclusion that I, I had when I talked about the move on from, from Bill and the move to Gerard. Feelings are considered here a great deal. They considered how Bill would feel, how it would look, and then I think that you're talking about an, an element with Gerard. He would consider how DeMarcus would feel or how it would look. And because it's this rebuild year, it was a pass. It wasn't supposed to go down this way. And they're just trying to stay afloat. I think they're trying to run out the clock on the season. They're running a stall. They're running a four corner offense. And that's what I was thinking yesterday when Mayo again stood there and said, as he often does, it starts with me. It starts with me. It starts with me. It starts with me. That is the same thing as we're doing what's best for the football team. It, in Bill's case, was cover for him not giving us anything. In Gerard's case, I believe it's probably cover for him not saying, look at the roster. Look at the starting five players that we have on the offensive line. We almost can't do anything on offense. Defensively, there's a lot of indefensible stuff going on. Trading Judon made sense to an extent. Uche does, was not a pass rusher except for a glimpse in 2023, 2022. For a three games glimpse. The drafting has been so bad that they're not talented on defense, but they have exacerbated that by being clueless as well. So I think that Mayo saying it starts with me, it's cover for him to not have to say, we really stink and we're going to stink for the rest of the year. And hopefully we don't get our asses handed to us and play stupid. But they played stupid yesterday and they got their asses handed to them. And then they got Arizona, and then they got the Chargers, and I guarantee you the Chargers are going to tear them a new one. Tear them a new one. And the Bills are going to do it twice. So they got five games, three of which would shape up to be blowouts, in my estimation. I think anything could That's be a blowout be a tough... at this point. Huh? I think anything is, it could be a blowout at this point, just given the way they played this past week. And you're right, and they're not getting any healthier. You know, they've got the bye week in two weeks, so maybe that'll help some guys. But you do look at the secondary right now. It's like Jonathan Jones is banged up. Christian Gonzalez, who I thought played well, was banged up. He was a game-time mm -hmm. decision yesterday. Kyle Duggar, and by the way, I did just get a text message from someone I trust who says, yeah, it looked like they were two for two on that one A-chain touchdown. Two for two with the backs, Marcus Jones and Kyle Duggar, and Kyle Duggar was slow to react. Shame, I wonder, shame, I, shame, shame, shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. I I, I just look at it, too. You know, the, that old saying, I wrote about this a little bit on the website. You know, that old saying, you're either coaching it or allowing it to happen. I do believe in it. And so that's why I, I, I put some of the penalty stuff on the coaches. 
But I think Mayo, if he were on with us right now, would say, well, what do you want me to do? You want me, you want me to bench Kyle Duggar for, for who? For Marcellus Dial? Del Pettis? Or Del Pettis? Marcellus Dial. Or Brendan Schooler? And after a game like yesterday, Tom, I might say, why not? <laughs> what, what's the harm? I mean, Duggar was, yeah. was one of the worst players on the field for you yesterday. You know, the tackles. Okay, what do you want me to do? You want me to put in a guard for Demontre Jacobs, which they eventually had to do? Yeah. Yeah, it might be worth it. There was, um, you really have to take a look. Michael Hurley has it on his uh, feed at the six-yard loss for Ramondre Stevenson. Oh. It was supposed to be a, a wide zone play. Yep. And it was pointed out that there were seven guys seven Miami defenders in the backfield. And it's just, it's in slow motion. Mike did us that courtesy and it's a cavalcade of chaos. <laughs> did you see it? I remember watching it in real time and saying to myself, I'm not sure I've motion. ever seen a run play like that here in New England where it gets blown up so fast. It was almost like you just gave it to a guy and there was no one blocking for him. They might as well have done that. Michael Jordan dove at the guy he was supposed to get, probably because he couldn't get to him because he's not a good enough player, dove at him, missed him entirely. So it looked like a stunt man. Uh, Vidarian Lowe was immediately beaten off the snap, so he's sprinting after his guy. So that's two guys. And then once that happened, everybody else's angle changed because, because they could see it was going so, so everybody else penetrated. Austin Hooper missed his block. There's five guys annihilating Ramondre Stevenson. And you look at a play like that, and you're like, you you wouldn't see that on a Pop Warner field in early October. I mean, a, a wide zone run like that, a, a a relatively direct run. You know, it's not straight downhill, but it's a it's just a straight handoff. For that to lose six yards, something special has to happen on that play for that to happen. You know, a reverse that goes I mean, for minus six. Tom, a screen might go for minus six. But my goodness, just a straight handoff. How do you feel about the two point? How do you feel about the two point conversion? I loved that. That was fantastic. Uh, you know, these little bits of creativity that we see from Alex Van Pelt. I understand you got to have. How do you feel about plays. the double pass? I hated the double oh. pass. Never let Kendrick Bourne throw another ball. Not only a horrible pass attempt by Bourne, who I feel like has thrown it before and has shown a much better arm than what he showed yesterday. Um, but what was was it? Antonio Gibson who was waiting on the other end. Like oh, it was that Stevenson. was like a. It was it was Stevenson, like a shallow fly that you know guy just lets drop in for a single in front of him. Like, hundred percent. Were, were you going to approach the football at any point there, Ramadre? It was up in the it was up in the air for about five seconds. Yep, it's like when I used to play catch with my kids and they didn't reach me. I just stare at it. <laughs> reach me, come on, reach me. Oh, all right, buddy boy, go do the breakdown, um, folks. Like I said, I'm sorry the aftermath was uh, was tardy. Uh, we had glitches, but we're back at it again. We will not have a Tuesday pod. I got to work on slants. Um, so we're going to be minus one pod. You're not getting a Sunday pod. You're not getting a Tuesday pod. You're getting a Monday pod that covers for Tuesday. And then we'll do the Wednesday pod, probably burp that up because you got Thanksgiving on Thursday. That's right. And you got the Colts. All right, Phil, get out of here. Thanks, buddy. Bye, Casey. Casey Bye. Keen's our producer. He's wonderful.